Hello class and welcome to the um, third lesson of our first unit on literacy. Um, in this PowerPoint I will be reviewing what we've learned in lessons one and two of this unit as well as talking about the culminating assignment for um, our literacy unit in which you'll write an essay about your own literacies. So in lesson one um, what we did was we first kind of talked about what literacy meant to us and, and practiced some beginning definitions and also talked about the kinds of literacies we've observed in our own lives. Um, and to kind of get your thinking going, um, and maybe, because um, I think a lot of you had some great things to say, you might want to consider, if you haven't already, taking a look through some of your classmates' posts in that discussion board forum. Um, a lot of you talked about technological literacies. Um, some of you talked about very specific kinds of technological literacies, like software programs you've had to learn. Um, some of you talked about learning visual literacies and using shapes and colors or um, social literacies um, relating to other people or understanding other people, um, emotional literacy. So I encourage you to go back and look through those postings to kind of get um, an idea of what everybody's thinking about um, since that's what the benefit would be of having an in-class discussion. Um, and we also talked about the fact that literacy is sociocultural. It's formed through social and cultural um, interactions and forces and contexts. And we also talked about the idea of multiliteracies, which is what you all were really posting about in that discussion board forum. That literacy isn't limited just to thinking about reading or writing, but in fact um, just a fluency or competency or ability to perform any number of tasks. So in lesson two, um, I first asked you to uh, read Sponsors of Literacy, an article by Deborah Brandt um, that was published in a national journal for um, college composition teachers. Um, it's called College Composition and Communication, and it was published in the late 90s. Um, and you might have gotten a sense for that time period, the late 90s, especially when they were talking about um, the tech boom and uh, some of the, I forget his name, Raymond Branch, I think, talking about um, his access to computers and to getting his own modem, you know, at one point that was more specialized of a thing. Um, not everybody had internet access um, back in the 90s and earlier. Um, in fact, I think that that took place in the 70s and 80s when he got his modems. That was really early. Um, and so hopefully the reading strategies that you read about in Karen Rosenberg's piece um, helped you out when approaching the Brandt piece. Um, what I want to do here is just kind of go over what I think are the main ideas that are really important to kind of take home from this reading. Um, and the first is that people don't become literate on their own. Rather, their literacy is sponsored. That's Brandt's central argument, one of her central arguments. And one that I think is important for us to consider because it's easy to think of reading or writing as something that just happened. Um, that's kind of natural that everybody knows, but in fact it's something that we learn to do in a particular way based on the sponsors who've interacted with us. And sponsors can be people, institutions, or circumstances. So it could be um, the bookshelf sitting at home um, that your parents had growing up. In fact, there was recently a study, I forget where I saw it published, I might have seen it in the Huffington Post, but they said that parents who have bookshelves with a large number of books, um, their children had um, different uh, test scores, higher test scores than children who lived in a home that did not have books. And, and um, I thought that was very interesting and it's kind of germane to this discussion. So I may track that down and uh, put it up in the sandbox for you all. Um, and sponsors can also be institutions that could be um, public libraries, churches, schools. Um, Really what Brandt's getting at, though, in this essay, um, she's trying to make an argument that we should think of literacy as in terms of um, economics. Um, this is less important for uh, what we're doing in the class. I think, so this is a new way of looking at literacy, and I think what I want you to take away from that is that when we talk about literacy as in economic terms, it allows us to think about literacy as something that's a resource, something that people, um, she talks about the ways in which people compete for it, um, she talks about how it's stratified, meaning that it's it's layered, that different um, people in different, in different socioeconomic uh, statuses have different access to literacy. Um, and she talks about reappropriation, um, which some of you have talked about so far in your um, blog responses, talking about how you've kind of used literacy in a way that wasn't originally intended by the sponsor. Um, that's an interesting part of her argument. Um, probably less important, though, than just remembering 
that um, literacy, really what I hope for you to really get out of this um, is that it's something that um, allows us power in society. Um, it's something that we don't have equal access to um, and it allows us different opportunities. And um, again, to go back to Raymond Branch and Dora Lopez, who were um, the two people from her first, uh, the first study that she summarized in the, in the book, um, or I'm sorry, in the article, we can look at how, you know, the different kind of access they had to literacy. You know, Dora had a secondhand computer or had to go use computer labs, and Raymond had his own computer um, at a time when that wasn't as common. Um, they had different educations. Um, Dora's family had to drive far to get the resources that they needed for their Spanish-speaking home. Um, all of these factors impacted both of their futures and their lives. And so that's what I want you to think about, the ways in which our literacies can kind of, um, aren't equally um, accessible to everybody and how they allow us to do certain things and different things. And that's a really important idea to take home and think about when you're approaching this last assignment. In lesson two, we also read um, a short essay by Amy Tan called Mother Tongue. Um, and this is one of my favorites. I sometimes tear up when I read this. I think it's um, very well written and very um, enjoyable to read, and I hope that you liked it too. Um, a couple of ideas that I want you to take away from this article. Um, one is that we use different discourses in different domains. What that means is that we use different kinds of language. Um, she talks about her Englishes, for instance, um, in different domains or parts of our lives. So um, she has a different home language than um, a language she uses when she gives a lecture, for instance. You might have a different home language, for instance, or language you use with your friends than the kind of language you use in a classroom, um, talking to a professor. Um, you, um, if you have a part-time job, or maybe if some of you are full-time job, um, you almost definitely have a different kind of uh, discourse you're using in that job as well. Um, so we use different languages in different places. Um, Amy Tan talked about her, her mother's language and how she has kind of a similar language that uses with her mother. And that's different from when she was giving her lecture. Um, and one thing I think is important to take away too is that we often base perceptions of one another based on languages. Um, we often, you know, there's lots of, you know, grammar Nazi jokes out there in the internet. Um, and I want you to take a minute to consider how many of those, sometimes when we talk about someone not having proper grammar, whether we mean that they use a different kind of language that isn't a normative language, a language that we don't see as normal and accepted. Um, standard English is spoken by a large number of people, but there's other Englishes too, um, and Amy Tan describes one, um, which is the English that her um, Chinese immigrant mother uses. Um, and I talked about in the first lecture how some of you may be speakers of Appalachian English or of African American vernacular. Um, these are also different um, non-normative language systems that still carry just as much meaning um, and, and value for those who speak them and often have just have um, their own sets of rules and grammars. So it's not that someone speaking these languages isn't following the rules, it's that they've learned a different set of rules for speaking. And I think that Amy Tan shows how sometimes when we label these non-normative languages as deficient or broken, that really kind of impacts the ways in which people who speak them are viewed. And we see that when her mother tries to go to the doctor's office or, or um, communicate with her stockbroker and isn't able to accomplish the things she needs to accomplish, even though she knows what she's asking for, she's very intelligent, she's read up on the material, because someone's perceiving her to be deficient based on the way she speaks, she's not being, she doesn't have as much access, as much power in these situations as her daughter who can speak standard English. So that's something really interesting that I hope you kind of think about and take some time to think about. Um, and maybe some of you have stories about using um, uh, more marginalized um, English systems that you would like to talk about in your first essay. Um, and I would welcome that. Um, the last point to take away from the ton, I think, is to think about the ways in which your discourses also shape not only how others see you, but how you relate to the world. Um, Amy, she has that quote on the um, third page um, at the end of the first paragraph where she says, My mother's tongue helped shape the way I saw things, expressed things, and made sense of the world. Um, I think that's an interesting point to kind of think some more about as well. 
So finally in lesson three, um, the last reading you did before viewing this PowerPoint um, was about the rhetorical situation. And I asked you to also complete a blog post about that. Um, and now I want to just take some time to quickly clarify what this means. I know this is a this is a term and idea that people sometimes have trouble with. Um, think of the rhetorical situation as basically being the context of a rhetorical event. So rhetoric is the persuasion that's happening or the idea or meaning that's being made. But the rhetorical situation is the entire situation surrounding that rhetoric. So um, some of you who have completed that um, response so far have noted that the rhetorical situation includes things like the audience, the, the writer, the text. So you can think of the rhetorical situation as being the person that's being persuaded, the person doing the persuasion, the text being composed that's carrying that meaning. So the text is the delivery for the rhetoric, the, the audience is the person that the rhetoric's being aimed at, and the writer is the person that is um, composing the text that is that has a rhetorical meaning to it. So again, the rhetorical situation is a way of thinking about the whole context around some kind of rhetorical event. And a rhetorical event could be as simple as, I have picked up a piece of paper and started reading it. That is a rhetorical event because now I am an audience, I am reading somebody's words, I'm interacting with a text. Um, it's happening at a certain time and place. Um, so that's a rhetorical situation. Um, the reason I have you thinking and reading about rhetorical situations is that it's important not only for understanding the text we read this semester, but next unit when we talk about genres, it's going to be important for thinking about the rhetorical situation behind a genre in order to kind of fully understand what a genre is. So that's something we're going to talk about more in the next unit. So keep these ideas about the rhetorical situation in mind, and you may want to keep that list handy of those five elements. Um, to refer back to when we start doing genre analysis and looking at texts through a lens of genre. So what remains um, for lesson three is now working more closely with the assignment itself, the literacy analysis. So the first thing you should do is take a look at the syllabus assignment description, which is on page five of the syllabus, and look look at what it is I'm asking you. I'm asking you to articulate an understanding of what your liter of one particular literacy, and I think this essay works best when you pick something very specific. One particular literacy, and you might also kind of, I think that um, a strong essay is going to make a relation to how that literacy is kind of situated within a particular domain or discourse community in your life. Um, one, one way to think about this essay is to kind of use two basic questions I've bullet, bullet pointed here. Essentially, I'm asking you to, to tell me how do you do what it is that you do, or how have you come to know what it is that you know? So, um, for instance, let's say that, to use an example that I mentioned earlier in this PowerPoint, you wanted to write your essay about the literacies you've acquired in your place of work. Well, then you can think about how it is you learned, what it is you learned. So maybe you're going to talk about sponsors, um, a text like a training manual, a boss um, or manager, um, a, a fellow employee whom you shadowed on the first day, or like someone really knowledgeable who you asked questions of, how they shaped the way it is that you do that job. Um, or maybe you want to think about um, something like a performing art, or um, some of you have talked about um, visual literacies or um, using particular software programs. Um, how do you go about doing that? How has that been shaped by how you learned to do it? So, um, you know, for instance, you don't just work at McDonald's, but maybe you happen to do it in a way that's really efficient because someone taught you how to do that. Um, so that's not just you working at McDonald's, that's work, you working at McDonald's efficiently. That's not a great example, but that's what I've got on the top of my head. So I want you to think about this, and I've got some um, a, a really long, thorough list of some ideas for you to think about for the essay. Um, there's a set of bullet points on that assignment description on page five. Um, again, I do really recommend that you pick something specific. So even if you want to do something like learning to read, I suggest you pick one particular moment that changed how you read or write. And um, the sample essay by Emily Richardson is a good 
example of that, I think, where she talks about learning to um, write an analytic essay. Um, so she didn't just talk about learning to write, you know, going back to third grade. She kind of started with um, one particular moment that really stuck out and allowed her to, to do some narrative work that really painted a picture, um, which I think is important because ideally this is in the genre of a liter literary essay, just like the Amy Tan essay that we read. Um, so it's your chance to kind of do a little bit of storytelling. Give us a picture of that really pivotal moment that um, you know, kind of relates to the literacy you're talking about. And then give us a lot of specifics about what's happening with that literacy. Um, what it is you didn't know and then learned. What it is that changed that. Lots of details. So she's not just writing an essay. She's writing it in particular ways. She's learning to think in certain ways. Um, so take another look back at Emily's essay. I think it's a really good sample. If you have further questions, um, please feel free to use the Lean On Me help form on Blackboard. Um, again, I think it could be helpful to ask questions where the whole class can see them. Um, and if you want to talk to me about potential topics for this paper, um, I'm happy to correspond with you. Um, I we can set up a time to chat online. We could even meet on campus if you wanted to. If you're around in Cincinnati this summer, I don't mind coming to campus to conference with a few people. Um, or doing so at a coffee shop just off campus. And um, of course, I'm also available to chat by Skype or something like that. Um, so to finish up this lesson, we have so far in lesson three read about and written about the rhetorical situation. So what you need to continue doing um, after you have viewed this PowerPoint is to read, sample, and view the samples I've posted and discuss these with your classmates on the discussion board. Um, start drafting your essay as soon as possible so that you have some time. Again, it's due on Wednesday, May 15th. Um, and at that point, you're turning in a draft to me that I will comment on, and you'll have a chance to revise it once more before you turn it in for a grade. But the better you can make that essay when you turn it in next Wednesday, May 15th, the better um, the feedback will be that I can give you. So I hope you find this helpful. And again, please get in touch if you have questions. Thanks.